Hello. Bonjour. Annie. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> I'm Dr. Olathe McIntyre, and I'm a staff scientist and member of the Green Team at Science Norm. So Earth Day was founded in 1970, and it marks the birth of the modern environmental movement. The Earth Day Network now includes over 190 countries and 1 billion individual, individuals mobilize for action every Earth Day. To learn more about the Earth Day Network, visit earthday.org. So the theme of Earth Day 2020 is climate action. So uh, joining us for a special Earth Day Blue Coat Talk is the founder and partnerships director of Youth for Nature, Marina Melanidis. So today we're going to talk um, about Marina's work around uh, youth leadership, nature-based solutions, and climate action. So welcome, Marina. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Oleva. It's so, so cool to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, and if you are joining us live uh, and you have a question for Marina, you can enter it in the comments. So we will check those. And feel free to include your name and age if you want to. So Marina, your objective is to empower youth to lead on nature-based solutions for climate action. And I wanna talk all about that, but to start off, can you explain what nature-based solutions are? Of course. So we're facing two big problems at the same time, right? There's the climate crisis, the world is, the earth is heating up, and there's also the biodiversity crisis. We're losing a lot of plants and animals. and these two crises are hitting us at the same time and what nature-based solutions are, there are ways that we can try to solve both of those problems at the same time. So the sort of technical definition of nature-based solutions are that they are ways to protect, manage and restore natural ecosystems to help us solve problems like the climate crisis while also addressing biodiversity loss and helping humans addressing human well-being. So that's really important too though, like nature-based solutions need to be backed by science, they need to be ambitious, and they need to be really grounded in justice, they need to be good for people in order to be effective. And they're really exciting, like I get so excited when I think about nature-based solutions, because there are ways that we can sort of go back to nature to solve um, some of the really, really, really big problems that we are facing all around the world. Great, thank you. Um, so knowledge sharing is one of the ways that you empower youth. Can you tell me what that looks like? Yeah, of course. So knowledge sharing is one of the three sort of pillars of work that Youth for Nature has. And I mean, the role that nature can play and needs to play in climate action is really, really important, but it isn't very well understood. It's complicated. There's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of nuance that needs to be addressed. Uh, but young people are super smart. And if we have the resources to learn and to grow, we can do really, really incredible things. So what Youth for Nature is trying to do with knowledge sharing is connect young people to those resources, connect them to scientists like yourself, connect them to knowledge holders of all ages so that we can learn more about that very question you just asked me before. What are nature-based solutions? What do they look like? How can I be involved as a young person where I am? And we do things like this. We host online events where we're able to connect young people to people of knowledge and expertise and increase their knowledge base around nature-based solutions. Uh, we actually have uh, one of these events tomorrow. It will be in Spanish and it's going to be about the social aspects of nature-based solutions featuring intergenerational speakers from Latin America. So check out the Youth for Nature website to learn more about that. Um, but yeah, we host them in a, in a bunch of languages and they're really just a way to, to increase that knowledge base and literacy around nature-based solutions for young people. And that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So storytelling is an action that you support. Um, can you tell us a bit more about, about that or what that looks like? Storytelling is my favorite part of what we do with Youth for Nature. Uh, there are so many wonderful young people all over the world that are leading in nature and climate right now. They're doing incredible things in their communities for their natural, for the ecosystems and, and the nature that's around them. And we 
feel like those voices deserve to be heard and those stories deserve to be told. So Youth for Nature is building and has built this platform um, so that young people can share their stories and, and we can help the world to hear them. I think there's actually a photo um, of the story map platform that we built that maybe we can bring up right now. But what we've done is we've collected almost 100 stories from over 35 countries all over the world so far from young people doing, oh, there it is, perfect, from young people doing incredible things. And you can see um, the, the points on the map show you where uh, the young people are coming from that have submitted stories so far. And you can click on those points on the map on our website and you'll see videos, you'll see photos, you'll see essays uh, that young people have submitted of the work that they're doing in their own words for nature and for the climate crisis. And moving forward, we're really excited to share these stories uh, and have as many people hear them as possible. Wow, so this is really uh, a worldwide kind of network. Youth for Nature is, is operating globally, which is really amazing. And you talked about sharing those stories. Would you be um, up for sharing one of those stories with us today? Yeah. Um, yes. Yes, absolutely. It's my favorite thing to do. Um, and you're right. Youth for Nature is a global network. We have a team around the world. But since Science North is based in Canada, um, and so am I, I wanted to share a story that we received from a young person from Canada. And it's actually from a young person from um, Ontario, which is where Science North is. Uh, so this is a story from two young people. Their names are Curtis and Taylor. 26 and 22, and they wanted to better connect people with the environment. They, but they found that the parks and the sort of natural areas around them were polluted. There was a lot of litter, there was a lot of garbage. They felt like people weren't taking really, they weren't connected to the environment in the way they needed to be to be able to take care of those places in the way that they deserve to be. And cleanup initiatives definitely exist. There's the great Canadian uh, shoreline cleanup, which is awesome. But what about all the pollution that ends up underwater? What about the pollution and the garbage and the litter that ends up in streams and underneath the water and rivers? Like, how do we clean that up? Um, where are the initiatives to do that? So they built their own called Project Snorkel. And Project Snorkel connects people back with local waterways, they educate their communities about pollution and the impacts of pollution on the natural world. They really encourage outdoor stewardship and the importance of, of getting outdoors. Uh, they help identify aquatic species, including invasive species and, and what that means for the environment. Uh, and they build and support inclusive communities through underwater cleanups. Um, there, I think there's a couple photos I wanna share of Project Snorkel. Uh, if we can bring up the first one right now. Yeah, there we go, that's them. So they actually partnered with uh, an organization called The Poison in the Apple, which is a youth-led organization. So this is a great example of youth supporting youth, which, which I love. And they started applying for funding and were successful and got enough funding to run um, a couple cleanups and to operate this project. Uh, so if we can go to the next photo, there's some photos of them actually running these underwater cleanups and removing pollutions from the rivers and the beaches. And this is such important work and this is such a great example of youth leadership for nature and for climate because nature really needs to be healthy in order to provide all of its benefits for us. Rivers and waterways are critical for managing floods and for providing habitats for many plants and animals. And by connecting people to nature, Curtis and Taylor are actively supporting people in becoming nature and climate leaders and climate stewards, which, which is awesome. And they're right here, um, right here in Ontario and Canada. Project Snorkel, check them out. Yeah, thanks for sharing <laughs> that. Um, I also want to share with you that we have um, a viewer from Kenya, uh, Prince Paul, who just wanted to say that you, uh, you provided such a simple and clear way um, of defining nature-based solutions. So thanks for that. <laughs> Hi, Paul. <laughs> Paul is um, a team member at Youth for Nature. He's our African regional director and he's incredible. Um, so shout out to you, Paul. You are a fabulous human. <laughs> awesome. Okay, um, capacity building is um, another thing that Youth for Nature does. Um, mm. 
how, how have you accomplished that so far? What's happened? Totally. So we're building knowledge around nature-based solutions for young people, and we are helping share stories of youth leadership. Um, but we also want to provide tangible opportunities for youth to build skills to become even better leaders um, and to have opportunities to, to communicate this knowledge that they now have. So what we've done so far is we've supported two global youth delegations to really big important international events where people make decisions about uh, global climate and nature action. So we went to the UN Climate Action Summit and the UN Youth Climate Summit, which was in New York in September last year. And we went to the, the official UN Climate Conference, which is called COP25, which was in Madrid in Spain uh, in December of last year. And we had 12 young people going to New York coming from nine different countries. And we had nine young people going to Madrid coming from seven different countries. And these were all youth nature-based solutions leaders. Several of them had actually contributed stories to our storytelling campaign, sharing the work that they did. And that's how we helped. That's, that's one of the ways that we were able to select uh, the delegation. And we actively contributed to these events. We didn't just participate. We hosted our own events and our own workshops um, at these conferences, youth-led events that were directed towards youth. We sat on panels, we told our stories. We, one of the, my favorite things that we did is in New York, we hosted this storytelling exhibition where we had this big 12 foot wall and we printed out photos and experts from the stories that we received and had them up on this wall and people walked by and were able to write on the wall about how they are gonna support youth. Uh, and it was such a great way to help really elevate those voices and get those stories heard to as many people as possible. Um, so not only are we like attending um, and actively shaping the conversation by adding our own perspectives, but it was an opportunity to provide really important skills to young people that are leading in this space, connecting them with people, with networks, uh, and other young people from all over the world that can help them be better leaders in the future and actively building capacity. And while COVID-19, the coronavirus pandemic has postponed a lot of these big international events, but that doesn't mean that like the capacity work stop, stops or there won't be any more opportunities for young people to really actively build skills in this area. A lot of these events are going online. Um, New York Climate Week, for example, will be online this year and a lot of other big events will be online. So we're going to be hopefully engaging in those events in a digital way uh, as well. And in the future, we want to like do some in-person trainings on the ground so that we can actually uh, build community in person locally and, and build skills among young people in this space. That is great. Yes. Yeah. I mean, a lot can be done digitally. I mean, mm -hmm. today Earth Day has gone digital this year. Yep. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there's a lot of work that you can do just out in the environment, right? Uh, I went for a walk down our Junction Creek today and there is so much garbage I can pick up, right? Mm -hmm. And that that does make a like Project Snorkel. Um, it made me think of that. Yeah. So I would, uh, I just want to give a shout out to everyone who's watching. And I do want to remind you that if you have questions for Marina or just comments or things you want to share, go ahead and, and leave those in the comments. Um, I'm wondering, do you have a, like a special Earth Day message you'd like to share with, with the youth and the youth allies who are, who are watching right now? Yeah, yeah, so this is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. This is the 50th time that we celebrated Earth Day and myself and other young people watching will likely be around for the 100th anniversary of Earth Day. And in order for the 100th anniversary to really be a day of celebration, to celebrate the work that we've done, to celebrate the ways that we've uh, addressed uh, these big crises, these big problems, the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis head on and we addressed it and, and dealt with it and solved it, we're gonna need everybody to stand up and answer the call, the call to action that this day, this Earth Day really is. Everyone, including you, including you who, are, who is watching <laughs> and thinking, oh, not me. Yes, yes, you, you know, you have important skills and knowledge and perspectives that this movement needs, everybody does. For young people especially, I would recommend joining local climate and nature groups in your community. Reach out to other young people around you that are doing this work. 
uh, and join those groups and, and help out and contribute. If there isn't a local nature climate group that you can think of at your school or in your community, maybe start your own uh, and reach out to people that have started their own or doing, their, doing this work in other places for tips and advice about, about how to do that. You can reach out to me if you want. I would love to help. Um, keep learning. Take, take some of this opportunity to be at home, to learn more uh, and to talk, to talk about the climate crisis, to talk about the nature crisis, talk to your family, talk to your parents, talk to your, uh, your teachers, your friends, uh, to youth allies, to all the youth allies that are watching, support the young people in your lives. I would not be here if it wasn't for the incredible mentors, the partners, the friends that I have across all generations that have helped me, that have supported me in so, so many ways to, to do what I've been able to do and, and to learn and to grow. So support the young people in your lives, help them to be the best leaders that they can be and keep learning yourself because we need you as well in this movement. This is not just a youth only movement. This needs to be intergenerational. The only way we're going to, uh, to, to make the 100th anniversary of Earth Day truly a celebration is by building a future together. That means that we need you, we need everybody. That is beautiful. <laughs> um, and absolutely networks. I mean, my, my network, the people who have mentored me have been so absolutely fundamental to, to my development and yeah. yeah. So keep mentoring, keep finding mentors. Um, I'll share a comment. Uh, so Chris Newman, um, is just saying that people like Marina are so inspiring to me. I have so much respect for today's young people who seem much more engaged and willing to take positive action than my generation is and was. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank thanks, you. Chris. It's really, that's really nice. I, I hear things like this a lot, like that, oh, the young people are, um, are going to lead the way and are going, are, are, are hope, which is, which is awesome. And, and I definitely believe that, but like, don't uh, undervalue your your role in this movement uh we need like i said before we need people from from every generation and like there are things that older generations can do that i can't and there and there are communities and, and people that you have connections to chris that i don't and you can and you can connect to those people and and talk to those people and build change in a way that i can't like you have a power there that i don't have um, so, so we need you to, to really wield that power and to use it for good and, and to be a part of this movement, just, just like me and just like all the other young people. So we have a question from Julie Muscalic, who's actually the science director of Science North. She's watching. Hey, Julie. <laughs> um, so she, she's asking, um, how did you get inspired to climate action leadership? And, and was there a moment in time for you that really inspired you? Yeah, I get this question a lot too. And I wish I had like, like that one aha moment. That's this beautiful story that I could share. Um, that would be really inspiring. But the truth, unfortunately, isn't, isn't that picturesque. Uh, I think it was, it was gradual. I am from, I'm a settler on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples, which is currently known as Vancouver, British Columbia. And this is a beautiful place to be. There, I'm, the mountains and the forest and the coast, the ocean are all right up against each other in my backyard. And I had the opportunity as, as a kid to, to go camping in these places and, and to explore the nature that was around me and to really just develop a very strong love for the natural world. And as I grew older and learned more about some of the the, the problems that this natural world that I love so much is facing, the threats that this natural world is facing. Um, I, I felt nothing more but like a duty and a strong need to do whatever I could to, to protect this world that I love. Uh, and, th and as I continue to learn more about the climate crisis and, and climate action and, and what we need to do to really, really effectively solve these problems, uh, I just got more engaged in, and started to, to continue to, to act in this space and to meet more people that were, that were also engaged and, and to keep trying to do everything I could. So it was, it was really just, it was a gradual um, thing that was supported by being able to go outside and be able to be connected to nature as a young person. And it was really supported by 
parents who were supportive of, of me wanting to know the name of every animal in the world and supported by parents and, and, and by teachers, I mean, who, uh, who helped me to learn and to grow and supported by peers who, who helped me to learn and to grow as well. So it was really more gradual. There wasn't really at one moment. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Satu who is age seven and they're wondering how can kids who are small help? Hi Satu, thanks so much for, for, call, for, for joining. Um, there's so much that you can do. Uh, I think one of the biggest things that you can do is you're already, you're already doing it is by learning more and learning what you can do and learning more about uh, what the problems are, but also what the solutions are. I think another really big thing that you can do is talk to your parents and talk to your teachers and talk to your parents about these problems and, and why they concern you and what things you think uh, your family can be doing to help. And there's a lot of things that your family can be doing, including, uh, you know, the, the, the ones that we hear all the time, driving less and walking more and, and taking your bike more and making sure to reduce waste by composting and by recycling and by buying less things, not buying things that you need. Um, those are, and those are really, really important actions. So I definitely recommend doing those and talking to your family and your parents about them so that you can get even more people around you also uh, practicing these really important strategies and tactics. But I would also recommend, uh, again, like just because you're seven, that doesn't mean that you can't make a really big difference. There's definitely youth groups and other groups of young people, maybe at your school, uh, that also care and want to make a difference and want to make a change. Start, start, a, start a school club with those people. Or if there's a school club that already exists, uh, join that club. It's a bit tricky with schools not in session right now. But if there's a, if there's a way that you talk to your friends, um, through on, on through online means or on the phone like you can still like make plans for when schools open again and how you can and all the things that you want to do in your school start have a bake sale and use the proceeds and donate it to uh, a local environmental organization that's doing really cool work in your community like there's so many amazing things that you can do um, and I hope that you're able to take this time at home to, to learn more and to start making some of those big plans um, and, and connecting and talking to your family and to your friends about it uh, so that you can emerge, we can all emerge from, from this time at home, ready to, to make a really big change and make sure that we're not just going back to normal, but we're making a better, the world a better place. Mm, absolutely. Um, so we have another question. Uh, as a young person leading very well on nature-based solutions and mobilizing a global movement, what are some of the key things that you have learned along the way? Okay, yes, good question. Um, I think the biggest thing I've learned is to surround yourself by people who are smarter than you. <laughs> if you if you want to to make change, if you want, to, especially if you're like trying to lead an organization or or an an international organization, especially or a movement, surround yourself by people who have different, who know different things and have different skills and have different perspectives and, and are smarter than you and are in are just as interested in building this as you are and work with that and collaborate with those people. If you, so if you are with a team of incredible individuals who are able to work together collectively, like there's, there's so much that you can do. And you, and you can do so much more than if you're trying to do it by yourself. So I think that's the biggest lesson that I've learned is don't try to do it, it by yourself. Find the people who want to do this too. There's so many, they're everywhere, we're everywhere and work together with those people. It's also more fun that way. Yeah, yeah I cannot <laughs> agree more. Um, teamwork makes the dream work for sure. Yeah. <laughs> wow, okay, so thank you so much for for spending this time with us and sharing all of your your insights and your work with our audience um, and to those of you who are out there who do want to learn more about this or maybe connect with marina um, check out youthfornature.org and search uh, why for nature on facebook instagram or twitter 
um, <laughs> to learn more. So thank you. Thank you so much, Marina. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Oleva. This was awesome. Thank you, Science North, for uh, helping to raise the voices of, of scientists and youth leaders um, on your platform. This is great. This is mentorship. This is collaboration. <laughs> Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everybody. <laughs>